This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. You're watching the Amherst Weekly Report from Amherst Media. I'm Claire Healy, and this is the news out of Amherst, Massachusetts from this past week. President Biden has issued a number of executive orders since being sworn into the Oval Office that personally impact a large portion of the country and undo a number of Trump-era policies. Regarding immigration, he ended former President Trump's ban on U.S. entry from majority Muslim countries and incorporated undocumented immigrants into the census. He also strengthened Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, and issued a proclamation pulling funds from the border wall. In an effort to more vigorously combat the pandemic, he issued an executive order coordinating a government-wide COVID-19 response, and he made mask wearing and social distancing in all federal buildings mandatory. He created the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, to address inequity within the COVID-19 pandemic through providing recommendations on allocation of resources and funding. Regarding the economy, he issued an executive order promoting a Buy American agenda. President Biden also focused a lot on issues of equity and human rights. He addressed a number of assistance programs, expanding food assistance programs and investigating Trump era housing policies. He issued an executive order banning discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation and ended the ban barring transgender people from joining the military. Focusing on the climate crisis, he rejoined the Paris Climate Accords and ended the Keystone Pipeline project. He issued an executive order supporting the reopening and continuing operation of schools and continued the freeze on student loans. These are only a few of the many executive orders and proclamations that the President has issued to address the climate crisis, inequity, and COVID-19. The year 2020 was full of both inspiring and catastrophic worldwide events. With so, many go so much going on in only a year, people turned to books to become more educated or escape the difficult reality of the pandemic. Amherst Weekly Report's field correspondent, Rebecca Duffy, went to Amherst Books in search of the books that shaped 2020 as a year. 2020 was certainly a year to remember with a worldwide pandemic, protests surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement, and many other historical events. But for those who may forget, there are books that influence 2020 that may help them remember. Co-owner of Amherst Books, Shannon Ramsey, sat down to discuss some of the books that influenced 2020. You can't talk about 2020 without talking about How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Gendi. Um, I think this book is like 2020 in a nutshell. During the protests of George Floyd's murder last June, anti-racist books became bestsellers, including this one. After um, George Floyd's murder, a lot of the conversation turned towards um, listening to black voices. And that's when this book really exploded. Shannon also picked out some children's books. Stamped is a book about the history of racist ideas in the United States written for children. It's starting to really just become a really big influence on how we talk to kids and what's important to tell kids of all colors about racism in this country. It is nearly impossible to talk about 2020 without mentioning the COVID-19 pandemic. One book written about the pandemic is And the People Stayed Home by Kitty O'Meara. It really just gently explains the pandemic and it really struck a hopeful note about the pace of everything slowing down and it's just a lot of, it's captured a lot of people's hearts and imaginations. Other books Shannon selected are Untamed by Glennon Doyle, a memoir about how women can become untamed from the patriarchy, and Hair Love by Matthew A. Cherry, a touching father-daughter story about grief and familial love. If you are looking to read these or any other books, you can go to Amherst Books for curbside pickup, or the store will be open after February 16th of this year. For Amherst Weekly Report, I'm Rebecca Duffy. An Amherst development team is preparing to build a four-story mixed-use apartment building at 348 Northampton Road. According to the Daily Hampshire Gazette, the building will feature 72 apartments on the upper floors and an ophthalmologist practice on the ground floor. 
Nine of the studio and one bedroom apartments will be affordable housing. U Drive South LLC is leading this project after acquiring two properties for $2.45 million. In the past two weeks, Massachusetts has begun vaccinating both staff and inmates at Department of Correction facilities. This accounts for roughly 22,000 inmates and correctional facility workers statewide, according to numbers from the Boston Globe. So far, as of this week, only around 1,400 people held in DOC facilities have been immunized, as well as roughly 1,600 doses given to staff, according to reporting by WBUR. Yet fears remain among those who qualify, due to misinformation and distrust surrounding the vaccine. Unlike many other states, Massachusetts has placed both correctional staff and incarcerated individuals within Phase 1 designations for vaccines. These types of environments, similar to long-term care facilities for the elderly, pose a higher risk of viral transmission, both within the facility and the wider community, due to their density. Those within them are also more likely to have pre-existing conditions, which leave them more vulnerable to severe complications of COVID-19. Former UMass Minutemen ice hockey star and local resident John Leonard recently made his NHL debut on the San Jose Sharks earlier this month. The Amherst Weekly reports Chris McLaughlin spoke with Alyssa Leonard, John's older sister who works as Assistant Athletic Director for Sales and Fan Experience for UMass, UMass Athletics. Before the coronavirus pandemic, the sibling pair worked side by side. John helped lead the Minutemen to the team's first NCAA Men's Hockey Championship game in 2019, and Alyssa works to promote and market UMass's varsity sports programs. Alyssa described how when her first current role with UMass Athletics opened up, it gave her a chance to return to her hometown, while at the same time, John's hockey career was rising at UMass. John's first year at UMass, I was watching every game I could on TV, but being in athletics, there were very often times my schedule conflicted with when his games were. So um, getting the chance to come home and watch him in person and you know be part of it with my family was so special. And my first year back was that national tournament um, run where they made it all the way to the national championship. And, you know, that was the biggest blessing for me just to be able to say hi to John after every game and, you know, be in the stands with our family cheering him on. So, um, yeah, like I said, our family's very close and, you know, all three of us and my parents included couldn't be prouder of him and are so happy that, you know, he played his college career here so we could be part of it. Alyssa also spoke about the significance of the Leonards being a local family and how appreciative and humbled they are by the support of the community. We uh, moved here in 2001, so John was just three years old, so this is really kind of the only home that he knows. Um, and just, you know, having him be that hometown kid has just been so special. He has so much pride in being from Amherst and the 413, and, you know, just he's built such a life here with so many friends in the hockey world and, you know, playing, starting in Amherst hockey all the way up to junior Falcons and, you know, all the way up through cathedral. So yeah, John just has so much pride in being, you know, from here in the local area and being the marketing director of hockey, you know, when he was here, all of these elementary schools, when we were trying to work things out with, you know, hockey team appearances, they were like, Hey, can John Leonard come? You know, he's, he's the local kid. And there were a lot of opportunities actually where we got him to be able to go back to Fort river elementary school, which is where we all went to school and, he was, you know, back in the classrooms that he was in telling the kindergartners like, hey, when I was five years old, I had a dream and I wanted to go to the NHL. And, you know, I'm, you know, at that point he was, he still had a lot of work to do to get there, but now it's a reality. And, you know, he's just so proud to be from here. Again, this has been his dream since he was five years old. And, you know, our family, there was never a doubt he was going to find a way to do it because he just, he has that drive, that determination, that work ethic, you know, both on and off the ice that, you need in order to make this your life. And, you know, I, I can say that he's done that. And it seems like he's still doing that out in San Jose. I would just say that our entire family is just so grateful for everyone's support in the area. Um, you know, the night he, he had his debut, you know, parents of kids that John played with way back in the day, you know, to everyone we know in town, like it's just, it's been so, um, humbling to receive everyone's support. And we are so grateful and, you know, there's a lot of people that made this possible. 
Despite successfully joining the NHL, John Leonard's road to San Jose was not without difficulties, according to Alyssa. John's college career ended on March 13, 2020, when the NCAA tournament was canceled due to the pandemic. Yet a silver lining came on the same day when San Jose asked John to sign a contract. However, with restrictions imposed by the pandemic, San Jose based their training camp out of Arizona, and uncertainty remained about when they would be able to return to San Jose. It took from March when he you know, was about to sign that contract until the end of November when he was able to get out to San Jose. But, um, you know, he never let it be a downside. I, I can tell you that, you know, he used the extended period of time he had over the summer to just train as hard as he could and do every single thing that he could to put himself in the best situation to, you know, make his debut this season. He's very easy to root for. I know I may be a little biased and that he's my little brother, but he, he does everything the right way. You know, like I was saying, all summer, he was out the door probably, you know, between 6 and 6.30 a.m. to drive down to Agawam and, and train. And then he would stay out there and do some skating at um, Olympia Ice Center in West Springfield. So, you know, he, he does everything he needs to. Thank you for watching the Amherst Weekly Report at Amherst Media. I'm Claire Healy, and we'll see you at the same time next week.